Hey everyone, my name is Jenna Spinelli. I am the communication specialist for the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State. And you'll see me a little bit later in the video leading a Q&A with Hanzi Lo Wang. But we are going to pick up this video about a minute into Hanzi's prepared presentation. We had some technical difficulties with the first minute or so of video. So in, in that first minute, uh, Hanzi talked about the fact that he's been covering the 2020 census since 2017 and uh, he was inspired to cover the census the more he learned about how it was responsible for so much of the people, power, and money behind everything that the government does. So we will pick it up with him expanding on that people, power, and money theme. We're specifically talking about how much power and money each person in the country is gets, essentially, how that money is, how that money, how that power is distributed. And that's kind of a hidden aspect I found of how U.S. society works that a lot of people are not really aware about. Maybe they've forgotten, they learned in school and they forgot, or they don't even know. And what's really interesting is that that information, this power and this money is really hidden behind really bureaucracy, hidden behind these forms. Let me take, let's take a look at this. You've probably seen these. Um, and behind envelopes and postcards that you may have received in the mail. Sometimes they're hidden behind bureaucratic forms, something like this. This is what the English language paper questionnaire for the paper 2020 census form looked like, the part of the first page. And sometimes they're hidden behind online forms. This is what most households used to participate in this year's census. But behind this seemingly kind of boring, bureaucratic things is money. We're talking about more than $1.5 trillion a year in federal funding for public services. The bulk of it, close to half, is Medicare goes to Medicare, the rest of it to Medicaid, education, roads, other public services. Census results guide the distribution of $1.5 trillion a year in federal funding. And if you're, you happen not to be so interested in money for your community, maybe you're interested in political power. Well, these results are used to redraw voting districts. And if you really want to understand how power is divided up, political power is divided up in this country, a key word for you to understand is redistricting. Another key word is apportionment, which I'll explain. If you live in a state, we're talking about those 435 seats for voting members in the House of Representatives that are distributed once a decade based on the results of the census, based on your state's population counts determined by the census. And if you are a voter, the 2020 census results determine the power of your vote in the presidential elections of 2024 and of 2028. Why is that? Because each state's share of House seats is determined in part by the census results. We're talking about the Electoral College, of course. 538 seats in the Electoral College, which is what determines who is the next president of the United States, not the popular vote. It's electoral college, and each state gets by default two electoral college votes. That's based on each state's by default two Senate seats. Also three votes that go to Washington, D.C. because of the 23rd Amendment. That leaves 435 votes in electoral college up for grabs every 10 years, depending based on the results of the census. What does this mean? This means that every 10 years, the national political map gets reset. Every 10 years, the, the shift, the balance in power gets reset. And the reason for that is because of this. This is the first part of it, of course. We the people, this we're talking about the U.S. Constitution. And if you didn't know already, before any, any mention of voting or of a president, the U.S. Constitution calls for, quote, an actual enumeration. This is in the sixth sentence of the U.S. Constitution. And the sentence before it spells out the original 
instructions for an actual enumeration, which is what we know as the census. That fifth sentence, here are the key words. From Article 1, Section 2, adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. These are the words in the U.S. Constitution that enshrine the original sins of the country's founding. It touches on the complex status American Indians have had in the United States for more than a century. So-called Indians not taxed were excluded from the numbers that determine each state's share of congressional seats. This section of the Constitution is also where you find what's known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. The decision by the framers to count an enslaved person as three-fifths of a human being. But in 1868, after the Civil War, the instructions for the census were changed. That was when in 1868 the 14th Amendment was ratified. And the updated instructions for the census, the, the instructions that we follow now, according to this Constitution, is counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. Now, by 1940, the Census Bureau, after consulting with the U.S. Attorney General at the time, got an opinion from the Justice Department that all American Indians by 1940 could be taxed by the U.S. government. So there's no longer anyone that could be considered an Indian not taxed, quote unquote. And so that came after a 1935 Supreme Court decision, as well as the Indian Citizenship, Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. But I want to point out one key word that has stayed with us from the original instructions and now the 14th Amendment's instructions for the census, which is persons. There's no mention of citizens. And since 1790, the very first U.S. Census, the numbers used for reapportioning seats in Congress, specifically the House of Representatives, have included both citizens and non-citizens, regardless of immigration status. This is important to point out because right now, the latest controversy over the census that I'm covering is an attempt by President Trump to make an unprecedented change. President Trump wants to exclude unauthorized immigrants from the numbers that determine each state's share of congressional seats, despite this 14th Amendment's requirement to include the whole number of persons in each state. The Trump administration is arguing that there is a Supreme Court ruling from 1992 that gives the president discretion to decide who ultimately is in this count. Now, a court in New York last month ruled that, yes, the president does have some discretion, but by excluding unauthorized immigrants, that specific change steps outside the president's authority. And that ruling has blocked the Trump administration's efforts for now, and it has also been appealed to the Supreme Court which is why I reported last week. The Supreme Court recently announced it's set to hear oral arguments over this issue, whether or not the president can exclude unauthorized immigrants from the apportionment counts. That issue is going to be heard by the Supreme Court at the end of November. Now, the court in New York found that there are federal laws that spell out exactly what those numbers should include. And if you hear the sirens, they aren't supposed to include the sirens. I do live uh, in New York City, so we hear sirens a lot. But the federal laws spell out that the apportionment counts are supposed to include a tabulation of total population. That's what's supposed to be transferred from the Commerce Secretary who oversees the Census Bureau over to the president. And then the handoff is completed when the president hands off these numbers to Congress to certify. And federal law says that the president is supposed to hand over a statement showing the whole number of persons in each state. There's going to be a lot of legal discussion about these words and what they mean over the next few weeks especially. And there were a total of eight lawsuits over President Trump's attempt to change, to make this unprecedented change to how census numbers are translated into House seats. And if you follow census news, all this talk may be giving you flashbacks to an earlier Supreme Court fight that I covered, and that fight was over this, a now blocked question. This is the 
controversial citizenship question that the Trump administration tried and failed to get onto the forms for the 2020 census. A lot of people did not realize that this question didn't end up on the forms, but here you are. Here's what the question could have, would have looked like if it were allowed. And it's important to, to make a quick point here. Take a look at this question. The responses only get at citizenship status. And it's important to point out that what President Trump wants to do, going back to what he currently is trying to do, he wants to exclude unauthorized immigrants from the apportionment count. And unauthorized immigrants are just a group of non-citizens living in the United States. There are, there's another major group, green card holders. And this citizenship question, if it were allowed on the census form, would not have asked about immigration status. Which brings me to another point that a lot of people have asked me, readers and listeners, it's not clear right now how President Trump, if the courts allow him to exclude unauthorized immigrants, how he could practically exclude unauthorized immigrants from the apportionment counts. Because in addition to not having a citizenship question on the forms, the 2020 census did not have a question about immigration status. So the Census Bureau says they do have records from Immigration and Customs Enforcement about unauthorized immigrants in detention centers that they could provide to the president and that could theoretically uh, allow for the exclusion of some unauthorized immigrants. And, and as far as other groups of unauthorized immigrants, the administration has told federal courts that it is un not sure right now what could be done at this time. But this is where we are right now with the 2020 census, the latest legal fight. And, you know, in many ways, this fight is intertwined with the fight over the now blocked citizenship question that I covered for more than a year. Because it's still an open question why the Trump administration pushed it at this question that you see before you. Why did the Trump administration want this question on the form? Want it so much, want it so badly that even after the Supreme Court ruled it could not add it, we, the public, were left hanging for days. When, the Trump, when President Trump tweeted out that the administration would still try to figure out a way to get this question onto the forms, why did the Trump administration want this question on the form so badly? It's still an open question. The administration said during the lawsuits that this question about citizenship was, to, was a way for the administration to better protect the voting rights of racial and ethnic minorities. And a judge in New York called that ultimately a sham. And the Supreme Court in its majority opinion, led by Justice Chief Justice John Roberts, called that contrived, that reasoning. And there's been a lot of focus on redistricting as the reason why, that there was an unpublished memo that got unearthed as part of the citizenship question lawsuits, a memo written by the late GOP strategist Thomas Hoffler, who for years and decades helped the, helped the GOP, the Republican Party, come up with ways to redraw voting maps in a way that would benefit the Republican Party. That memo that Thomas Hoffler wrote ultimately said that adding a citizenship question to the 2020 census forms or to any census form could benefit Republicans and non-Hispanic white people when voting districts are redrawn. But I'll leave you with this. While I was digging through all of the emails and internal documents the Trump administration released as part of citizenship question lawsuits, I couldn't find a mention. I did a keyword search, couldn't find really a mention of redistricting. Instead, I saw another term pop up multiple times, including in this email. This is an email that Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, who oversees the Census Bureau, a Trump appointee, received just about two weeks after the Senate confirmed him. And it's one of the earliest emails the administration released as part of the lawsuits uh, as a record for its push to add a citizenship question. You see the subject line here says, your question on the census. This is an email from a then advisor for, at the White House to Secretary Ross. And you can see, based on what's written in this email, that in the earlier, earliest months of the Trump administration, this is back in 2017, how much power each state has in Congress and Electoral College, that was on the minds of the top political appointee in charge of the Census Bureau. That is what 
the Supreme Court is about to hear just over a month from now. And that has what has been one of the reasons why the census has been really put on into, uh, into a tailspin for these past few months, in addition to the pandemic. So there's a lot to talk about, about how the census and the power and money related to it, how it's all playing out, how it has played out over these past few months, how it may play out over the next few months, uh, because the 2020 census, this story is not over yet. And I'm happy to take your questions. Great. Well, um, Hansi, thank you so much for for that that presentation. I'm glad we we have a a recording of it. I, I feel like that should be played in every high school and college like government class. It's a great <laughs> overview about the the census and kind of the role that it plays. Um, if if anyone has has questions, and I'm sure you do, you can feel free to put them uh, in the the Q and A box. I know we have both a chat and a Q and A um, in this session. But if you if you have a question for Hansi, um, please put it in the Q and A box, and I will try to get to as many of them as I can. Um, while we're we're waiting for some questions to, to come in here, Hansi, can you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in the census and and how you came to to cover it as the primary focus of your work at NPR? Well, I uh, first covered the census um, when I was a reporter on NPR's Code Switch team, which focuses on issues of race, ethnicity. And, uh, and later when I joined uh, NPR's national desk, uh, I was assigned to cover demographics, uh, similar to what I did at, at Code Switch. And so certainly how we understand uh, what the demographics are in the United States is, is through the census. And uh, I knew was I, when I was assigned that beat that uh, some major decisions were about to be made about the census. This is in the years leading up to 2020. And so uh, I, I made sure to include that on my list of things to keep tabs on. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that um, you know, by the time most of the country is thinking about the census, a lot of the decisions and the discussions of what should be included, what questions should be asked, and how the census can be conducted, uh, that's really pretty much set in, in almost concrete by the time people are thinking about it during the census year. It's the, all the years, uh, the decade leading up to the census year where those questions and decisions are, are up for discussion, but a lot of people aren't paying attention. And so I started paying attention and I really started digging, um, I, I say, I, I like to say I went really down the rabbit hole uh, when uh, the Census Bureau put out a major report in 2017 announcing the question topics for the 2020 census, as well as uh, what's known as the American Community Survey, which is uh, the largest survey that the Census Bureau conducts. It's not the census, uh, but it asks a lot of uh, detailed demographic questions that a lot of uh, parts of the government and researchers rely on. And in that report, um, I saw a, a really interesting change in the appendix where it was first published uh, among the question topics that were listed at first were sexual orientation and gender identity. And then hours later, the tr uh, Trump administration, uh, the Census Bureau, uh, put a revised copy of that same report and sexual orientation and gender identity disappeared from the appendix, and the Census Bureau essentially called it a, a clerical error. I filed Freedom of Information Act requests and found out that there were multiple federal agencies under the Obama administration that requested sexual orientation and gender identity questions, not on the census, but specifically on the American Community Survey. But ultimately, I reported out the Trump administration uh, did not push forward with that idea. And it was an interesting story to um, kind of uh, an, an entry point for me of, of all the kind of behind the scenes, often uh, overlooked um, decisions that are made um, quietly behind the scenes uh, outside the public view that can have major implications on what information is and is not collected uh, for the census and other major Census Bureau surveys. Yeah, and that, that brings up an interesting point. Uh, somebody in the in the, the chat mentioned that uh, they they consider you to be the most valuable source of information on on the census out no there pressure. right now. Um, and, but so how did how did you come up to speed? It, it seems like this is an interesting mix of both data skills, but also especially in the you know recent months and years, the the legal skills as well, being able to sift through these court documents and filings and things. I mean, I have to confess, I don't really consider myself a data reporter, which will surprise a lot of people because I'm known as the census reporter and people just think of data um, immediately, I think a lot of people. But I, I really 
um, I'm still scared of really Excel spreadsheets and, and, and combing through data and rely on my colleagues at NPR uh, to, to really help me with that. And, and really, I, I've, this has boiled down to a lot of legal reporting that I've had to really learn trial by fire, no pun intended, or maybe intended, I don't know, uh, learning about how uh, the, the PACER, which is the, uh, the, the, the online court filing system, how to access that, um, and, and really learned um, all the different policies. That's, that's really been my focus, the policies that the Census Bureau uh, develops and gathers input about that really, uh, that's what really determines how the census is conducted, what questions are asked, um, why they're asked. Um, these are all des decisions uh, made bit by bit over years um, that, uh, again, are made kind of at, at public meetings that a lot of people don't pay attention to, that um, Information is gathered through federal register notices that people I didn't even know really existed until I started reporting about it. Um, that's where public input is gathered. Um, there are all these processes that people just don't pay attention to because they just don't know. And um, I, it's really just been osmosis and trial and error, um, just learning bit by bit as and relying on a lot of uh, former uh, Census Bureau officials and, and other experts that have been following this uh, for, for decades, really. Uh, much longer than I have, and uh, I've learned from them and made mistakes along the way and been called out and, uh, and, and tried to, uh, to, to just figure out how all this works. And uh, it is uh, a vast body of knowledge, and um, there is just such a, a long and complicated history of how the census has been conducted in the United States. And so it's been challenging and, and, and very rewarding and um, just in uh, just an endless um, just well of information to explore. Yeah, and we'll, we'll maybe come back and, and talk more about your, your coverage here, but I do want to get to some more process questions that are, are, are coming in here. So we've, we've been talking a lot heretofore about the Trump administration and about the courts, but where is Congress in all of this? As I understand it, they're the ones that ultimately receive the, the the census count at the end of the year or, you know, whenever, whenever that, that ends up happening this year. So yeah, where, what is, what is Congress thinking in all this? Where, where do they stand? How are they thinking about what's going on? So to be clear, title two of the U S code requires the president to deliver the latest uh, apportionment counts to Congress uh, within a week after the first day of the regular session of Congress. I hope I got that right. What that translates to, if, if January 3rd is indeed going to be the first day of the new session of Congress, as it uh, typically is, it's as by January 10th is when the president has to deliver the latest state po uh, apportionment counts uh, to Congress to ultimately certify. And in uh, federal law, uh, Title 13 uh, requires the clerk of the House to send the certified results of the census and uh, the apportionment count, how many seats in the House of Repres Representatives, the certification, that has to go to each of the uh, governors in each state uh, from the clerk of the House. That's the process. Um, and so that's um, that's what the role of Congress is for for the apportionment process. And so it is a question right now of whether or not, depending on how all this works out and what Congress looks like after the election, um, how that process will ultimately play out despite what is uh, dictated by these laws. Um, and also the timeline here is in flux because it's an open question whether or not the Census Bureau can meet this earlier deadline of December 31st and can the president get the numbers in time to make that uh, handoff to Congress. That's an open question that I'm tracking. Uh, but another big thing to keep in mind here is that ultimately the con Congress is the body that is delegated the authority to oversee the census from that's according to the Constitution that ultimately according to the Constitution Congress is the ultimate decider and Congress uh, has delegated its authority to the executive branch uh, through the president and also through the Commerce Secretary and uh, it's been a big question of whether or not Congress would pass laws to extend the reporting deadlines. This, the first of which is December 31st, the reporting deadline, which uh, just as of last week uh, had a really big implication on whether or not, or when exactly the administration uh, could end counting uh, because there was uh, this tension that the Census Bureau said that it didn't, if it didn't end counting as soon as possible, it couldn't meet that December 31st reporting deadline. Um, and ultimately, counting has ended, and, uh, and that law that requires the reporting of the first set of results is still December 31st, 
And technically speaking, Congress can still pass a law. There are a number of bills uh, introduced by members of the House. Um, there's a, a bipartisan Senate bill, uh, but it's a big question whether or not Congress uh, is actually practically going to be passing any laws uh, before the election and after the election. So that's something to I'm, I'm tracking because it could have uh, some implications on how these uh, the apportionment process, uh, the reporting process, how that all plays out in these coming months. Yeah, and, and is there any any historical precedents for Congress not not accepting? I don't, I don't know if that's that's the right term, but of of you know Congress kind of stepping in at any any point along the way in this this process. There is a precedent uh, in Congress not accepting the results of a census. This happened after the 1920 census, and. For a decade, the 1920 census, after the 1920s, about a decade after the 1920 census, the seats in Congress were not reapportioned, uh, which means that the number of seats that uh, each state had after the 1910 census, that remained the same through the 1920s and until a, a new law was passed. Um, and after the 1930 census, if I'm getting my history right, and if I don't get this right, there will be census historians that will be emailing me very soon. Um, but after that, that's when this process became more automatic and uh, there were specific steps. So there is that precedent. Um, and also there were times when the reporting deadline for the census results, the legal reporting deadlines were missed by the US government. Um, and the Congress, uh, this is in the 1800s, Congress did ultimately pass laws that extended those deadlines and uh, they, you know, the, the apportionment uh, continued to happen afterwards. So that's that's something to keep in mind as well. Yeah. So they can unclear right now whether or not they will. Um, exactly. Okay. And it's also unclear just the full implications given um, all the different circumstances we're under right now. Sure. Um, so a couple of questions here around the idea of you know what do we know now that counting has in effect ended i understand paper forms can still be collected through the end of this week but what do we know about how much of the the population has been counted how does that compare to previous census years and and how how reliable is that count at this point i think we should be very clear um members of the public um uh, you cannot mail in your paper form at this point and, and expect to be processed, to have your response processed. You can't be counted right now, uh, full stop, uh, including paper forms. Um, the Bureau is only accepting paper forms that are postmarked by October 15th and received by October 22nd at their uh, data processing centers. So uh, effectively right now, you can no longer respond by paper, just to be very clear. Um, at this point, there are some early preliminary indicators that the Census Bureau has been putting out uh, in terms of uh, giving the, uh, the public a sense of possibly just how uh, accurate, how complete the census results are. They are really, uh, in a way, um, a pinhole and really preliminary because a big part of the census process is processing. Um, I don't know if that counts as a pun, but processing, that's a really big part of the census process that gets overlooked. Um, and that processing is when the Census Bureau takes all the information that it's collected over much of the year and goes over them, does runs quality checks and tries to eliminate duplicate responses. So no a person, no household is counted more than once and counted in the wrong place. Um, it's also trying to make sure that folks uh, may have been reported in a home that isn't their usual residence are reported at their actual residence, uh, the place where they're living or sleeping for most of the year. This takes time. It takes expertise by career officials who run quality checks over and over again in order to get it right. And there is a major question right now uh, whether or not the Census Bureau has enough time to run those checks that the Trump administration has put pressure on the Bureau to shorten and uh, really cut back on a number of quality checks. 
and forced the Bureau to redesign its plan for processing the results. And it really increases the risk of serious, serious errors in the results of the 2020 census. This is based on internal emails and reports uh, that the Census Bureau's career officials have put out and released as part of the lawsuits over the census schedule. And so uh, there are some indicators right now that the Census Bureau has put out. These are preliminary results. And they really show you what's happening um, at the moment, uh, the Census Bureau says, at the national level, some at the state level. But it's really unclear what, what the status is at a local level, uh, which is where a lot of people's focus is at, because that is, there are major implications here if a count is wrong in a community, in a specific neighborhood, uh, in terms of funding, in terms of local representation. And so those are all open questions. And so far, the Census Bureau has not released that kind of detailed level of uh, data to really give any indication of how uh, what the level of quality is of the census results. Part of that is unanswerable because the Census Bureau is still uh, still has to do this processing and also has to conduct, um, in addition, a really important part of this is known as the post-enumeration survey, essentially a, a team that goes out and conducts uh, a sort of uh, mini census in a way um, and, and asks a, a sample of households around the country similar questions in order to figure out the undercount rates for historically undercounted groups. We won't see the results, though, until the first set, until uh, fall of 2021, so it's going to be a while. Yeah, and it seems there's also a, a, a bigger a bigger issue here potentially of just declining trust in the census, right? So if, if people are kind of conditioned not to to trust the results, it is something in the in the constitution that has to happen every every ten years. I don't think it's likely we're going to have a, a constitutional amendment to, to change that given our dynamics, although who knows what might change in, in ten years. But our are people in within the the Census Bureau thinking about these bigger term issues of of trust in their the institution and then the the work that they're doing? I think the Census Bureau career officials are always thinking about trust because that they they can't do their jobs without having some level of public trust. These are, yes, the Census Bureau is, is constitutionally mandated and there are federal laws that require participation, but Census Bureau survey and general survey methodology uh, tells us that the best quality data is from participants who volunteer their information, that uh, give information, share information about uh, themselves, about their households voluntarily. And that requires public trust, uh, a public trust in that the Census Bureau uh, is doing this for the public good, uh, that the federal government is doing this for the public good, that the Census Bureau and whatever administration is currently in power will uphold laws that protect the confidentiality of census information collected, that will keep the information, people's personally identifiable information, confidential for 72 years, that the information will be only be used for statistical purposes. And these are all this all hinges on the public trusting the Census Bureau, the federal government to uphold those laws, to do this for the public good. And the question now is, is that this past year, especially, uh, not, not just because of the pandemic, but the Trump administration has forced upon the census so many last minute schedule changes with little to no public explanation when those changes are made with little to no public input, that it's a real question what long-term impact that can have on parts of the public going forward on when they think about the census, will they think about this chaos that has erupted uh, for this 2020 census, that there were weeks, uh, days where I literally by the hour I was looking at court filings trying to figure out to tell the public how much longer uh, is census counting going to last. Uh, it, it could have changed by the hour for some days uh, over these past two weeks. Um, it was uh, nail biting, it felt like a roller coaster ride. All of this uh, is certainly exciting for a reporter to track. Um, but uh, is really, it really throws into question um, whether or not that engenders, that promotes public trust going forward. 
Yeah, and have you heard anything from the um, enumerators out in the field? You know, or have they they encountered you know uh, pushback or or any of that distrust or you know any type of hostility to to you know depending on whose door they they might be knocking on and what information that person may or may not have received about the census and its purpose and those kind of things. Well, I think one thing to keep in mind is that distrust is not a new thing when we're talking about the census, um, even from its earliest days in this country's history, uh, that there, there always have been segments of the population that just don't trust the government, uh, even back in colonial days, um, uh, or, or rather um, in the earliest days of the country, rather. Um, and so that's not a new thing. And, and certainly uh, decade after decade, census door knockers have encountered that. And uh, I have heard anecdotally, census workers have told me anecdotally that uh, they have heard concerns about changes made by the Trump administration that uh, further discourage some households from participating. Uh, that's certainly part of it. Um, and there, there also was a major concern uh, from a lot of communities given this anti-immigrant atmosphere that uh, has been uh, with us for, for years now, that a lot of concern uh, from historically undercounted groups, immigrant communities, about uh, what this information could be used for despite federal laws uh, protecting the confidentiality of people's individual responses. Right. Um, a couple questions in the, the Q&A here that I'm going to try to put together uh, regarding this, this issue about um, citizens being, being counted as, as far as uh, re reapportionment goes. So um, first, has any other president ever thought about or is there, or is there any, any evidence that any other president has tried to do something like this? And then also, what, what are the, the stakes here? Um, somebody in the, the, the Q&A referenced that there was a, a Washington Post article that cited that we're maybe only talking about one or two seats if if non citizens are not included in this, this reapportionment count. I'll start with the second question, and I'll have you, uh, Jen, if you don't mind, just repeat that first question. I think I missed that first part. But uh, the second question, I think the, the the shortest answer is we don't know what reapportionment ultimately is going to look like, and a big part of that is because of the pandemic. We we really don't know how much of a disruption the pandemic caused. Um, that there, there was so much uh, migration that we know about through surveys that the Pew Research Center has done, uh, through through news reporting. That we we don't know how that uh, may have really changed uh, projections made by demographers and uh, redistricting specialists when they tried to figure out, game out, uh, how many seats each state might lose if this happened and that happened. The pandemic is a major X factor that I don't think anyone can really fairly quantify. I don't think it's possible. We just don't know the extent to which it, it really disrupted the census. So I think uh, because of that, I would say any projection that you read, this is how I do it, any projection that I read, you got to take it with a major grain of salt uh, because this census occurred in, in addition to last minute changes by the Trump administration to the schedule in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. So who knows what these numbers ultimately bear out and who knows how that ultimately uh, will affect each state's uh, share of congressional seats in the end. We just don't know. Uh, Jenna, if you don't mind repeating that first question. Sure, yeah, yeah. The, the first part was just, has, has any other president tried to do something similar to what the uh, Trump administration is, is trying to do now with leaving people who, who are not citizens out of the uh, reapportionment count? As far as I know, no U.S. president has called for and, uh, and issued a presidential memo that sets as U.S. policy the exclusion of unauthorized immigrants from the apportionment count. Great. Um, let's see here. Uh, several questions here about um, new political appointees. What what have you learned about the the influence that they're having in the Census Bureau or perhaps not? Well, I, I know that there are currently four political appointees that the Trump administration has appointed in over three months. And as term, in terms of their influence, it's really hard to say at this point. I've been having trouble really confirming it. 
Um, there are two main uh, political appointees with uh, very high uh, top level positions. They are filling uh, newly created deputy director positions, one as a deputy director for policy, one as a deputy director for data. These are very high up positions uh, filled by two individuals with uh, no obvious qualifications for taking on high ranking positions at the Census Bureau. And it's unclear to me exactly what influence they're having. Um, certainly, I can tell through emails that have been released, they are part of uh, top-level discussions about the census schedule and presumably about the policy uh, decisions being made right now regarding the results of the census, giving their titles. But exactly what they're doing and uh, the, the extent to which uh, they are exerting influence, that's unclear to me. I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah, and I guess to to, to follow up on that, I, I mean, how how have you gone about developing sources within the bureau? And you know, prior to the the twenty twenty census process, what had the the bureau's relationship with the the media been? Hmm. Um, I I think um, I guess I took a, a bit of a field of dreams approach. Um, if you report, they will come. And uh, I've, I've, I've kept on reporting over the years and a lot of folks have, um, have reached out to me. Um, and you know, I, I, uh, I learned very quickly that the Census Bureau is a federal agency made of, of dedicated career officials that uh, really, uh, in addition to upholding their, their oath to Title 13, um, you know, certainly they cannot release people's personally identifiable information, but they also are, are very loyal to the institution and, and generally do not speak to the media when they are not authorized. And uh, this is an organization, uh, an agency made up of career officials who are dedicated to the mission of getting an accurate and complete count of every person living in the country every 10 years. And that is really the bulk of their focus. Um, this once a decade project um, that they are preparing for uh, in the years in between. And, and so speaking to the media generally um, is something that they generally shy away from. Um, given the number of controversies and decisions made by the Trump administration that really have gone against career officials' recommendations and, and research uh, by the Census Bureau um, itself, um, that has motivated a lot of folks to speak out, not just to me, but to other journalists I mean, other news organizations. And, and generally speaking, the Census Bureau I think generally considers itself as uh, an information source for the country that it regularly fields questions, not just from uh, journalists, but from researchers, academics, um, sometimes from members of the public, just trying to get simple questions answered about uh, the country's population in a given area and uh, often holds webinars and events trying to encourage uh, members of the public to use the data because ultimately this is public data. This is not data that require the public to pay subscription fees uh, or, or to pay for this information. This is the public information. And, and so the Census Bureau, um, I think, generally has seen itself as an information clearinghouse. Um, but I have noticed um, that in recent months especially, that a lot of questions that I've tried to get answers from from the Census Bureau, there have been delays. And uh, I have not gotten answers to some of my questions. Um, given uh, presumably, you know, interference from um, administration. Yeah, and uh, so you know, Hansi, we we live in this kind of bifurcated media world where I would say on 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 the one side there's there's NPR and kind of what we think of as as traditionally mainstream media outlets, but then there is this whole other right wing media ecosystem. Do you have any sense of of how the census is? is being covered or not in, in right-wing media outlets? And, and is that something that you kind of keep your ear to the ground on as, as you're doing your work? I really don't have a good answer for that. I'm, I'm just trying to keep up with the beat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. there's enough to keep up with, uh, with all the Census Bureau's reports and press releases and public meetings. So I, I, I don't have a good answer for that one. Yeah. Um, several questions here uh, about um, do you, do you anticipate a broad legal challenge kind of questioning the the results of of the census and is there anything that the that if if Joe Biden is is elected anything his administration might be able to do to have have a recount or or those anything like that 
I think if the past uh, is any indicator of what we're, we're uh, heading towards, um, generally speaking, after each census, there is a slew of lawsuits that are filed from states, from cities, uh, local municipalities, uh, challenging the results of the census uh, once they, once uh, folks get their hands on them and, and do some analysis and, and figure out exactly what it means uh, for states and local communities in terms of political representation. And, um, and that's uh, very likely to happen after the 2020 census, uh, especially given all of the challenges and all the questions about accuracy, uh, given the pandemic, given the last minute changes uh, that the Trump administration forced upon the census schedule. So it's, I'm, I'm getting ready to continue being a court reporter uh, for the foreseeable future uh, beyond the Supreme Court fight. In terms of what a Biden administration can do if Joe Biden is, Vice President Joe Biden is elected the next president of the United States, um, that's, a, that's a really interesting set of questions that I'm also trying to figure out as well. I think um, you know, a lot of questions that I often see is, can this census be redone? Can we just redo this census? And I think um, one way I'm approaching this question as I do my reporting is you really got to break that up into more questions. It's much more complicated than just, oh, let's just redo it, uh, because this is the largest peacetime operation, mobilization of the federal government uh, that the government undertakes. This, this is a huge, huge project. And, uh, and, and just redoing it is not as easy as it sounds. And I think in addition to the political will, in addition to who is president, uh, it's a question of who is controlling uh, each house in Congress, who is controlling the house, who's controlling the Senate, as well as who, uh, is there any uh, interest among the lawmakers to pay for this? This is expected to be the most expensive US census in history, around $16 billion. And uh, that's not a lot when you look at the whole share of federal expenditures, but there has been ongoing pressure from lawmakers over the years for, uh, on the Census Bureau to really cut down the cost of conducting a census. And that has already uh, forced the Bureau uh, years before now to, to cut back on really critical tests that the Census Bureau was planning to do and ended up not doing because it didn't get the money that it asked for from Congress. So I think that really... Uh, leaves open the question of whether or not lawmakers are willing to pay for another census, uh, even if there is political will to do that. And, and those are questions that I think uh, are certainly something that I'll, I'll be exploring depending on how this election turns out. Yeah. Um, several questions here about the, the role that philanthropy and, and community groups play in terms of getting the word out while the the counting process is, is happening. Obviously, that the Census Bureau does its its own communication. There are folks like you who are reporting on this. But what who are the other players here that, that help make sure that the count is as complete as it can be? Well, there are a number of uh, national nonprofits and civil rights organizations that have really been um, at the forefront of advocacy at public meetings, uh, as well as um, just doing outreach that the Census Bureau uh, hasn't done by itself, that the Census Bureau, you know, you know, part of the dynamic here is that public trust, going back to that public trust, and the Census Bureau recognizes that uh, as a federal agency, it is ultimately the government, and that a lot of people ultimately don't, don't trust the federal government for a lot of reasons. And so it relies on these trusted messengers, that's what the Census Bureau refers to, these local community groups that have established ties with local communities, and, and that's where these organizations come in. And that's, uh, they are the ones carrying the Census Bureau's message and trying to help people understand just what the stakes are uh, when we're talking about the census. And so they've played a role for a number of decades now, and uh, that they are funded, a lot of them, by philanthropic foundations uh, that see this as part of uh, trying to promote civic participation, similarly as elections and voting uh, and, and protecting the vote. Um, and this is part of that effort. And it really has been a key for the Census Bureau to really try to reach historically undercounted groups. Uh, these are groups that have uh, help to give voice to a lot of concerns, specific concerns for immigrant communities, non-English speaking communities that have uh, really specific needs. And when we're talking about um, just, you know, something as specific as uh, advertising campaigns, uh, how they should be done and, and how best 
to make sure it's a message that resonates with specific communities because this is not a one-size-fits-all project if you're trying to get every person living in the country counted. Right, and and the the flip side of that, um, several folks in the the chat are saying that they work particularly in the the Philadelphia area, and uh, as part of their door knocking efforts, they would hear from folks who said, "Oh no, somebody came and said that I didn't have to do this or these these types of things." What what can you tell us about the the disinformation campaigns that that might have been out there during the counting process? Yeah, I wasn't really focused so much um, on the different information campaign, other than I just know, I just knew, and still know that it's it's really easy to uh, to just not know the facts because it is so complicated. Because there are so many last minute changes by the Trump administration, it was hard for me to keep up with what what exactly is the latest, uh, what what is the current schedule, what what are the new procedures. And so that made it a really ripe environment uh, for just just basic misinformation to be happening. Um, and, and certainly, uh, I know I was aware that there were disinformation campaigns, but I wasn't closely tracking specific efforts and, and didn't really dig into them. So I can't really speak to any specific efforts. Yeah. Um, so a couple more uh, questions here as, as we, we start to, to wrap up. Um, so we've heretofore been talking um, pretty much entirely about the census, but I know you mentioned in your talk the uh, American Community Survey, and so there are other other sources of data that the government has. Um, one person in the, in the Q&A said they were surprised by how little was actually asked on the census itself, thinking about all the, the, the data that the government does use. So can you walk us through um, some of those other sources that work in conjunction with the census when it comes to, to making some of these decisions about, about money and, and power and these types of things? As far as I know, and I, I don't have a good answer for you, but just um, uh, what I know is that uh, the census is a major source. The American Community Survey is a major source of information uh, when dis dis deciding uh, federal funding uh, distribution as well, uh, because those are uh, together really the most comprehensive set of information about uh, who's living in the country. And um, can you uh, walk us through, I, I know you covered this in your, your prepared presentation, but for folks who might have joined late or just want to, to kind of reiterate it, the next steps in the, the timeline of, of where we go from here, at least as you know them right now, I realize it changes by the day, sometimes by the hour, but what are some of the, the major milestones we should be looking at moving forward? I think the next uh, major news story that I'm watching for is what the Supreme Court decides, whether or not uh, the Supreme Court is going to allow President Trump to exclude, try to exclude, uh, because it's a question of whether or not he'd have, he can practically do this, uh, whether or not President Trump can try to exclude unauthorized immigrants from the apportionment counts. The Supreme Court is expected to hear oral arguments at the end of November, November 30th, and uh, it's really up to the Supreme Court when it releases its decision, but it does, by hearing oral arguments on November 30th, it does uh, allow the court to make a decision and, and release that decision sometime in December, which would be right before this legal reporting deadline of December 31st, which is another key date. That's when federal law says the latest state population counts are due from the Census Bureau through the Commerce Secretary oversees the Bureau to the president, and that really kicks off an apportionment process that uh, then continues on to, uh, is if, I, if I have my math correct, uh, Matt, January 10th is when the president is required to deliver the latest state uh, apportionment counts to Congress to certify. And uh, sometime in January, I don't have that date offhand, I uh, don't remember that date, but sometime in January is when the House, uh, the clerk of the House is required to certify those results and send them off to each of uh, the state governors. And so that's the process uh, coming up. Um, generally speaking, uh, the, the Census Bureau, just to be clear, hasn't stopped door knocking. Uh, it, counting has stopped, but it is still door knocking at some homes to conduct what's known as a post-enumeration survey. This is not at every household. This is only at some households. The Census Bureau is conducting these interviews to try to figure out the undercount rates for historically undercounted groups. The way the Census Bureau figures out 
the rate at which uh, black people, Latinx people, uh, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, American Indians, what rate at which they are undercounted, and they have been undercounted decade after decade, that rate is determined by this post-enumeration survey, which is expected to continue, this in-person interviewing, expected to continue through December 22nd. So that's something that will still be happening. The Census Bureau is currently uh, hiring workers for that. So another thing to watch out for. Yeah. Uh, and, and so thinking about this this case that's now before the Supreme Court, what is the government's argument here for for excluding unauthorized immigrants from from reapportionment? Essentially, the Trump administration is arguing that because of the Supreme Court decision in 1992, Franklin v. Massachusetts, that decision uh, specified that the president does have authority, some discretion over ultimately what the numbers are that are handed off to Congress, those apportionment counts, and that it is what the president hands off to Congress and not what the Census Bureau through the Commerce Secretary hands off to the president is, are, are the numbers that count. And so the Trump administration is arguing that uh, even though the president hasn't really exercised, any president before has really tried to exercise this kind of discretion to make this specific change, President Trump is now trying to exercise this discretion and to exclude unauthorized immigrants. What that is running up against, uh, the challengers of the Trump administration's efforts are arguing, and what a lower court in New York has found is that there are statutory laws, there are federal laws passed by Congress that specify that what the Commerce Secretary hands over to the president and what the president is supposed to hand over to Congress is a total population based on the census, and that has been interpreted uh, to be every person living in the country regardless of immigration status. And that has been the case uh, for since the very first census in 1790. Those counts have included both citizens and non-citizens regardless of immigration status. Right. And so you, you've said that the, the oral arguments are, 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 I'm sorry, I'm reminding me what, what is happening on, on uh, November 30th. Is that when oral to keep arguments track start or is that when the, 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 the decision is supposed to come out? November 30th is oral arguments. We oh, don't arguments. know okay, when the decision comes out because the Supreme yeah. Court can do whatever it wants, whenever of it course, wants, essentially. Of course, of course. <laughs> uh, so is that, that, that seems like a, a long time from now. I mean, is, is, is part of this waiting to see what happens with Amy Coney Barrett's nomination? or you know why it, is, is that normal to, to wait this long between when something kind of comes and when the the oral arguments begin I think this is a better question for Nina Totenberg but but what I will say <laughs> okay. uh, from my reporting um, is that the Trump administration asked the Supreme Court to expedite to speed up its review of this case. This was a late breaking case uh, that the lower court in New York issued a decision in September and, uh, it, and now has just been scheduled, which is a, a very quick turnaround uh, to get on the Supreme Court's calendar. And on November 30th, the Supreme Court already was scheduled to hear two cases. So this is really squeezing in another case. And so I don't know uh, whether or not the justices factored in the possible uh, confirmation of uh, Judge Amy Comey Barrett or not, I don't know. Uh, but certainly it was the Trump administration's push to uh, try to expedite this process, uh, presumably uh, so it can be done while uh, during President Trump's current term in office. Yeah. Uh, so, Hansi, I know you started the, the year. I saw an, an Instagram post from you. You were somewhere in rural Alaska covering the very first census counting back in, in January. Tuxuk Obviously, Bay, Alaska. Was in, yeah, thank you. That was the long ago before times. So I'm wondering you know, how you, you thought your coverage might unfold this year versus how it actually has unfolded in our pandemic world. Well, I, I was expecting to do a lot more traveling and um, and really and really uh, and see how the census was going in different parts of the country. In addition to how it went in Tuxuk Bay, Alaska, that that fishing village on the southeast coast of Alaska, where the 2020 census officially started, um, per tradition, uh, to start an Alaska native village. Um, when the ground is still frozen and it's easy for census workers to to get around and try to get. Uh, communities there counted uh, before fishing and hunting season really uh, kicks off. And um, when I came back, uh, you know, weeks later, uh, the, the pandemic was declared and uh, we, we all went into lockdown. And, and so um, that certainly uh, 
you know, it, it's gone by in a flash in a way, as I'm sure for a lot of folks. But um, I didn't expect to cover the census really from my apartment. Um, but uh, that's how I've been doing my job. Fortunately, I have been able to, to had the privilege to be able to work from home, um, but that really has limited my perspective on how the census has been going on the ground. And, uh, you know, despite the pandemic, the census did continue on the ground. Uh, census Bureau workers put on face masks and tried to socially keep social distance, uh, as well as uh, nonprofit groups, community groups, volunteers, trying to promote that outreach. Uh, they went out into communities and, and tried to do that in-person outreach in recent months. And, and that's something uh, that did continue. And uh, it's something that I've had to report uh, from uh, report on remotely. And uh, it, it's been not what I imagined. And certainly I, I don't think, um, you know, it's just uh, it's the year of COVID. So here we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, question here, we, we, as we said, the, the, the Supreme Court ruled recently that the, the counting process had to stop as of, of Friday. Um, any, anything you've heard about why the court might have, have, have went that way? So I think some folks were, were surprised by that ruling from the court. I think this might be a better question for Nina Totenberg Nina or Totenberg. <laughs> Supreme Court Watcher. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I'll say is just to be very clear, uh, the count ended on October 15th at 11.59 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time, which uh, was around uh, 5.59 a.m. Friday, October 16th, Eastern Time, just so we're clear. Got it. Got it. So there, there are several other uh, legal questions here. Sorry to folks asking those. I, I'm going to spare Hans from having to defer to Nina Totenberg anymore during this Q and A. Um, what is what's the the most creative thing you saw to encourage census participation? I didn't see this because of the <laughs> pandemic, uh, but I, I spoke to a, a community organizer in Texas. Uh, who went around, this is uh, just before um, really not lockdowns occurred around the country, and, and drove around with a, a bullhorn and in a car in, um, in the colonias uh, in uh, the Rio Grande, Grande Valley um, in Texas, some of the hardest to count uh, parts, uh, hardest to count communities in the country, and, uh, and trying his best to get the word out uh, by just with the, the bullhorn um, uh, from his car. Uh, that's the way to do it, uh, you know, socially distanced. And I think there were versions of that that happened in other parts of the country. And um, it, it was just, uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic when this this took me by surprise, um, it, it was just a, a really interesting example of, of how a, a local community group, community organizer just worked with what he had in trying to get the word out in the best way, most effective way he could think of at the local level. Hmm. And uh, what's what's next for you? I mean, obviously the these legal challenges will continue through the end of the year. The the census process will continue into the early part of January, as you've said. But where does your focus go uh, after that? Right now, I'm I'm focused on uh, seeing all these different legal fights through and seeing. Uh, the results of the 2020 census um, being reported out. Um, you know, the first set are the latest state population counts. That's due by law December 31st. Um, and then it's a question of when the Census Bureau will release state redistricting data, which current federal law says they're due by December 31st at the latest. It's an open question whether or not the Census Bureau can release it by that time, because essentially all the changes that the Trump administration has for forced upon the Census Bureau has really forced the Census Bureau career officials to deprioritize uh, getting those state redistricting data, getting those data out uh, in time. And it's it's a really an open question when those would be out. So um, when people ask me what I'm doing after the census, I, my question is, when does the census end? I don't know. I just don't. <laughs> yeah. And it, it might be too early to, to think about this, but folks in the chat are, are asking, is there anything that cities, states, other uh, localities can do to start preparing for the 2030 census? That's a big question. Um, I, 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 there are a number of folks I think that are better equipped to answer that. Um, I'm thinking about all the different nonprofit groups um, that have really been focused on the outreach. I, I think from my perspective as a journalist, 
Um, it's just there's a lot of basics about the census that a lot of people just don't know about. And uh, did the very like, what is the point of the census? Why are these letters being sent to my home? Why are these postcards? Why am I getting door knocks? Uh, what is this thing to begin with? And my goal, uh, one of my goals as, as a reporter of the 2020 census is, is really this explanatory journalism, just to uh, remind folks something that they may have forgotten from their civics lessons in, in school, or maybe they never got it in school. And, um, and, and this is an opportunity to remind folks of this is really how power and money are distributed. Uh, this is a hidden framework in a lot of ways. Um, hidden uh, system and uh, the next go ahead as far as I know is happening uh, 10 years from now and uh, hopefully that's plenty of time to get people uh, thinking about it and, and to take it as seriously uh, as voting uh, when they're thinking about what to do uh, ahead of 2030. Right. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you again to everybody who put great questions in the in the the, the q and i'm sorry i didn't get to to all of them um i do have one last question for you hansi so one of as i was going through your kind of back catalog of of census pieces for npr um one of my favorites was one you did about saturday night live oh. and the the sketches on the on the census i guess there's been one uh every every year you know since since snl's been around so you know 1980 1990 2000 2010 but none this year so uh, i guess first of all um how did you know that and if the snl writers somehow find this talk on youtube or or encounter it some other way what what would you say about a, a census sketch or or joke or you know how how might you you frame that if you were going to do something on on this year's census well i, I figured that out by doing some research um a lot of help from margo anderson uh, I would say the census historian at University of Wisconsin uh, and uh, Milwaukee, and she is the one that's been tracking a lot of those SNL skits over the decades. And uh, I double checked that information and uh, realized that uh, 2020 would be the SNL still has a shot here. Um, I don't know if they think it's still relevant and newsy enough, but we'll see. Uh, they are in their new season, and we're in this unusual situation where the census is still kind of in the news um, into the fall here. And uh, so we'll see about that. And, um, you know, through my reporting, I, I learned that as far as I know, Tina Fey wrote at least two sketches. So she seems to have this track record of writing census sketches. Um, and so maybe they, some writers should give her a call if they haven't already, she may have some <laughs> tips. Yeah. But uh, you're you're not you're not gunning for for that job. You'll you'll stick with your your day job. I got enough to do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm Hansi. This is this has been great. Uh, thank you again to everyone uh, who who attended and who asked such such great questions. Uh, and this talk was recorded, um, so we will uh, send out uh, the link to everybody who signed up. Um, but again, thank you to Andrew and and the libraries, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, take care, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye bye.